ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to The Briefing Room. Yes, indeed, my name is Eric Cavanaugh. I will be your moderator for today's event in which we're going to talk about two of the most exciting topics out there in the world of information management today. Yes, I love the name for the event, folks, Operation Real Time, Analyzing Big Data Now. So we've got our very own Robin Bloor on tap along with our friends from Akunu. So here is a slide about yours truly and enough about me. So the mission, as many of you now know, here in the briefing room is to reveal the essential characteristics of enterprise software. So what we do is we arrange live analyst briefings with independent analysts. Sometimes it's our very own Dr. Bloor. Oftentimes it's an array of independent analysts we work with all over the country and frankly all over the world. We have quite a few who dial in from Europe, even though it's a bit uh, later in the afternoon or in the evening out there. So the, the whole idea is we want to give you a very clear perspective on what these technologies are, how they work, why they were designed a certain way, and that's why we have these live briefings. The analyst and vendor do not participate in a, a pre-show, if you will, so that way we keep the conversation very organic because we're trying to capture the kind of dialogue that you get in a live analyst briefing. So we cover a different topic every month. March is operational intelligence. In fact, we're doing a whole review of the operational intelligence field right now at InsideAnalysis.com. We'll be taking briefings over the next few weeks with over 25 vendors, I believe, in this space. As many of you may know, it started really in manufacturing. That's where operational intelligence was most prominent until recently. But now we're starting to see it in several other disciplines as well, certainly in financial services and a variety of other spaces where companies can take action on analytics as the things are happening out there in the real world. So there is a spot about operational intelligence, the ability to make decisions and act quickly, automated alerts and or response. So the idea is that you want to be able to very quickly ascertain changes in metrics or changes in something that's happening on the production floor or in the stock market or even out there in the social media world. Obviously, lots of folks are really hopping onto sources like Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook to post various bits of information about companies, about organizations, and the real cutting-edge firms out there are capturing that information in real time and doing analytics on it so they can capture really important insights about what's happening and stem the tide if something bad is going on or seize opportunities very quickly. So Robin is the analyst today calling in from Austin, Texas, and we also have our folks from Akunu. Tim Morton, in fact, is dialing all the way in from London. So Akunu, as many of you may know, offers a Cassandra-based real-time analytics platform. So we're going to talk about how Akunu is leveraging the open source Cassandra database to build and extend business applications without uh, you needing to have a database expert. So this is kind of an ongoing theme here in the briefing room. We've heard several times. So there's Tim. He's going to be our first presenter. Keep in mind, folks, the Q&A component of this webcast is really the most important part for many folks, and that relies upon you asking good questions. So don't be shy. You can send your questions in using the Q&A component of your webcast console. That's down there in the lower right-hand corner. Or you can chat them to me as well. And we also tweet with the hashtag of BriefR. So with that, I'm going to push Tim's first slide. I'm going to hand the keys to the WebEx over to Tim Morton. And with that, Tim, just click anywhere on that slide and use the down arrow on your keyboard, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you, everybody who's joined and listening in. And uh, I look forward to your questions later. I think I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes, just a few slides to set the scene, tell you a bit about Akunu and uh, real-time analytics and also uh, a bit about how we use Apache Cassandra. Hopefully I'm going to give you a bit of insight into what people use Akunu Analytics for, and in particular some of those um, operation real-time, in operational intelligence use cases um, that uh, that's the subject of the webinar. So once I've managed to navigate the slide, here we go. Okay, so there's... Um, I guess big data is a pretty crowded and uh, confusing space. So I wanted to just start by uh, sharing my views on uh, a couple of aspects, I guess a couple of the categorization of a couple of aspects of the space. So firstly, where, where data comes from. I think you know, there are two main sources for big data, uh, so by which I imagine we'll, we'll probably share a sort of 
uh, or have heard a definition which encompasses uh, velocity and volume and value and uh, variety and, and many other these. But I think there's two real key sources out there that, that, that we need to look at. First is uh, data generated by very large uh, populations or crowds of people. So potentially we're talking social media data um, or, uh, or, or data sort of in, in web, search, uh, web search logs there. But there's an also a very important category uh, that's generated uh, automatically, the sort of so-called exhaust data that is produced from the various infrastructure that runs the web that is part of our everyday lives uh, and the mobile phones that we carry around uh, with us almost uh, almost everywhere. So those two sources are really, I guess, the, 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 the key uh, pieces that make up uh, where big data arises from. So then the question is really, what, what do we do? What do we do with it? What purposes is it deplete, deployed for? So the one that I'm going to focus on in, in this briefing is really talking about operational intelligence. So this is the ability to have real-time views on key metrics uh, in order to be able to make uh, decisions in a timely fashion. So those decisions being part of some business process where there is a real value in having fresh data to make a decision on and where there's a very, uh, a very strong correlation between making a decision rapidly and actually reducing the impact of or, or increasing the benefit of that potential decision. So those decisions might end up getting made by humans via looking at live uh, dashboards or they might get made automatically by applications uh, that uh, encode alerts. So, you know, you have some threshold, uh, you say you do not want the quality of this result to go below this level, or you do not want the latency of the system to go above this level. And by encoding that, uh, those business rules and that logic, you, uh, you, you automatically decide when, uh, when the appropriate time to take action is. But fundamentally, it's all about taking action using metrics which you have some insight into in advance. Now, that's quite interesting because it differs from perhaps uh, what I would say is the most widely recognized notion of big data analytics, which is the sort of needle in the haystack analysis typified by Hadoop, probably the uh, earliest uh, widely known big data, uh, big data software system. So there what you're looking at is uh, finding correlations and exploring very large data sets, typically unstructured data sets, and doing arbitrary complex analysis on it. So whereas with uh, exploratory analytics, you are really trying to mine correlations and uh, relationships from uh, disparate sources of data that perhaps you didn't uh, no existed or that perhaps you don't understand the importance of to start with. Operational intelligence is about taking the insight that you already have or that perhaps you glean through offline exploratory analysis and saying, right, I know I need to do something when the price of this stock exceeds this level, when the latency of this application exceeds this, when perhaps the battery life that my app is uh, sucking out uh, is more than 10% worse the last time I wrote the uh, software for the for that particular for that particular app. So it's it's about encoding uh, encoding knowledge learned through exploratory analytics and uh, being able to summarize these very large data sets so that you can make meaningful decisions on that data. So. You see that there are really two different things that are, that are important uh, in, in, in this. And these aren't distinct categories either, really. You know, it is a continuum. On the operation intelligence side, the key thing that you're looking at is the speed of the queries, really. You're looking at how fresh is the data that I'm making decisions on, and what is the response time? Like, how long is it going to take me to find out the answer to the, the, the data that is the input of the rules which I might react to? On the flip side, what you're really looking at is how, how complex is the 
uh, analytics, how rich are the queries, and how comprehensive are the data sets for me to mine my correlations. So these are really two different sides to um, the large uh, space that is, uh, is known as big data. So um, I thought I'd give a bit of a, 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 a brief technology timeline for, for, for this and just help position uh, the various NoSQL and uh, Hadoop systems in, a, uh, in, in, in their place here. So I think it really all started with relational databases. You know, as an industry that's uh, 30 years mature, um, people have been putting valuable business and, and infrastructure uh, information into relational databases for a long time. They, are, they remain a very good choice where you need strong transactional semantics, perhaps you're processing financial transactions, or where your data sets are relatively small. The key benefit you get there is that you have rich, fast queries, but as uh, the whole tenet of the big data space talks about, uh, these systems are fundamentally not scalable economically for data whose individual value is low, but where in aggregate there is, is value. But to actually mine that, you're dealing with large volumes of data at rest and high velocities of data arriving. So if you go back to the days of the emergence of big data with the web giants, including uh, Google, Amazon, uh, eBay, and so on, the... Uh, the technology space split into two, I think, and I mean, this is sort of characterized by looking at the technologies developed at Google. You have Bigtable on the one hand and you have MapReduce on the other. The key, the key objective here was to bring horizontal scalability to uh, the database technology space. Now, both MapReduce and Bigtable achieved that, but Bigtable did so by sacrificing rich queries it gave you very high, very high performance, um, low latency reads and writes. But Hadoop uh, took the opposite approach. So this is where you can do arbitrary computation, you can run very rich queries, but jobs typically take minutes or hours, often large numbers of minutes or large numbers of hours for large data sets. So you know, here you... you, you, you you gain the ability to tolerate uh, and manage big data sets with both of these uh, technologies, but in different ways. So I think in the very recent months, we've seen the emergence of some very interesting sets of technology, and I'm, I'm you know, very happy to discuss uh, these in, in, in the Q&A uh, afterwards. So what's happened in the Hadoop space was we've seen the emergence of uh, some, some systems which describe themselves as real time, but really what we're looking at here is uh, dramatically increased performance uh, on exploratory analytics systems where the user may not have any idea what the query is going to be in advance, where the system has no knowledge in advance of what the query is or sometimes even what the structure of the data is, but the, um, the system is aiming to allow you to run a very rich uh, needle in a haystack type uh, analyses. So on the flip side, Akunu Analytics, which I'm going to obviously talk a bit more about, is takes a different approach. What we do is we build back the notion of a rich query framework on top of NoSQL technology, and in particular on top of Apache Cassandra. What we give you is significantly uh, lower latencies and improved query performance compared to any, any Hadoop or Enterprise Data Warehouse hybrid, but by uh, we, we do so by allowing you to express uh, knowledge that you have in advance about what the key metrics are that you're looking to use. And these two sets of technologies are, are very applicable for the two broad categories of use case that we talked about on the previous slide, operational analytics and uh, exploratory data analysis. Akunu Analytics is very much an operational intelligence tool, whereas um, Hadoop and enterprise data warehouse hybrids such as Impala, um, Pivotal HD, the, the new Green Plum announcement, are very much about allowing you to find a needle in a haystack just faster. So before I come and talk about um, analytics, I just wanted to sort of touch on uh, Apache Cassandra. So we've been working with Apache Cassandra for a number of years. Uh, we we've contributed a, a range of uh, 
a, a range of features back to uh, Cassandra. We implemented the probably the headline feature of the latest release v1.2, which is virtual nodes. Uh, we implemented uh, Cassandra query language and, and, and built the majority of, of, of that. Um, and we did so as part of obviously a, a larger open source community. But we picked Cassandra for supporting, uh, you know, we, we, we built a business around Cassandra because it has some great, uh, it has some great design properties. It's horizontally scalable. It has great multi-data center support. It has no single point of failure it, and is highly available by design. Um, and it also, not only all those things, but it also has a number of, uh, a number of features which make it a, a really good building block for real-time analytics, uh, in particular atomic counters. So as well as all those feature-based things, there is a sort of soft uh, rationale for choosing it, which is that there is a very vibrant community, there are numerous large production deployments out there, um, and uh, we absolutely see it as uh, one of the dominant systems in the space. So Apache Cassandra is a great starting point for building real-time analytics applications, but through our experiences working with uh, Cassandra clusters, you know, customers who came to us to take our distribution of Cassandra or to ask us for support or, or, or training, um, from our experiences there, what we really observed was that people were having a really hard time um, building applications on top of Cassandra because the, the key value interface, which Cassandra shares with many other NoSQL databases, and which in particular inherited, inherited from the big table um, design that uh, Amazon Dynamo followed, Sorry, the big table, uh, big big table um, row column data model. That uh, that actually proves very very difficult for many of the organisations that we were working with to build applications on top of. Um, the query semantics are very tricky to um, work with if you don't have complete pre knowledge of exactly how people are going to read back your data. So. If I put in a key with a name and the value is the address, if I know precisely that name, I can get back precisely that address. Um, if I want to do a range query across a bunch of names between two points, I can do that. But say I want to find all the people who live in, um, in London, say, that's actually something that you'd like to be able to do and that a SQL database would be able to, uh, to help you with in a number of different ways. Unfortunately, that's a pretty tricky exercise in Cassandra because, like with many NoSQL databases, what you're, tr what you, what you're doing or what the design pattern that is encouraged is for you to, um, is for you to denormalize your data. So to write multiple times uh, into the database in order that you've written every combination of how you might want to be able to uh, read that data out. So that's great until your um, boss comes along and says, actually, can you support this new feature? Can you support me extracting this data in a different way? Or I'd like to produce a board report and I just need these numbers once. Um, so there you're reduced to either using, uh, you know, writing a complex map reduce function for something which is a very straightforward um, pattern, or you, uh, you, you need to re rewrite your application. And that's, uh, and, and reorganize all of the data in your database. And both of those are not uh, fun prospects. By the way, it's not just Cassandra that, uh, that, that has this property, many other, um, many other systems do. So through our observations there, what we've done is built a rich query framework which takes away the task of data modeling from the user and uh, automates and optimizes that process ourselves. So, Akuno Analytics is a system which sits on top of Cassandra and takes in high velocity streams of data through a range of different interfaces and uh, also takes patterns of queries that you would like answered in real time. So you can think of it, if you're familiar with Cassandra, as a way of building denormalized Cassandra data models automatically. So say you're collecting clickstream data, say you're building something like Google Analytics, you know, you, you know the range of dashboards and widgets that, and graphs that you're looking to display. 
perhaps you're looking to um, count the number of visitors or unique visitors to a particular page or potentially a, a section with a page and with a subsection, uh, you maybe want to break that down by geography, by uh, browser, um, or by the profile of the visitor. What you can do with Acuna Analytics is using a uh, unimaginatively named query language called Acuna Query Language, uh, which resembles SQL in terms of you know, the, the concepts the, and the, the keywords you use, the selects, the where's, the group buys, the joins, the havings, and so on. What you can do is express a set of cubes you say to Acuna Analytics. I would like to be able to, uh, to you know, I would like to be able to take this click stream and I would be able, like to be able to graph it according to these parameters. You know, so I want to be able to do things like select count and select count unique, where, uh, where geography or where browser grouped by time. And Akunu takes that definition and builds you an automatic data model inside Cassandra and it takes data as, as, takes events as they're collected and continuously maintains uh, the results for the or the intermediate results which will help it answer these queries so that later when you come back and ask a query like find me the number of visitors who landed on this group of pages uh, and were using the browser Chrome uh, between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock yesterday group by minute that results in a single underlying read to the data store and that means that the queries that you get back are instant essentially milliseconds, just the time of, that it takes to read a uh, single sequentially located set of values from Cassandra. So by doing that, we let you build flexible, uh, you know, build, build, build up a set of queries, either access through a programmatic API, we have a RESTful HTTP-based JSON API, or a set of dashboards, which are really a thin veneer over that same API. So just to drill down into this a bit further, we have, a, you know, I, I mentioned uh, a range of different ways of taking data in. You can just fire snippets of JSON at, uh, at the HTTP API. We have Apache Flume integration. So uh, if, as is usual, you already have a Hadoop deployment and you're looking for a operational intelligence solution to complement your uh, unstructured data warehouse, you can simply use Acuna as a Flume sync and collect data from your existing data flow architecture. We have event bus and MQ integrations. Um, and uh, once you've collected that data, we store both the raw events and the uh, aggregates or the results, the intermediate results for these queries in Cassandra. So we have a range of ways of pre-processing that data it comes in. But the key thing is that you always have that historical context. And that means that at some later point when you come back and Ask a query, we can we can, we can we can get those results and we can compare them across different time periods. So, for example, um, because we also have an alerting mechanism, you can do things like uh, find me the latency across these range of systems uh, that's happening now, and do some regression analysis on that, and compare that to what's happened on average on this same Thursday morning over the last four Thursday mornings. And if the trend in five minutes will be, say, greater than two standard deviations away from that average, then uh, you need to tell somebody about that raise and alert. So as well as doing all, all of these things and you know, maintaining these quantitative analytics, we also maintain a link between the analytics and the raw events. So you, that enables drill down. So you can see you know, perhaps a, a distribution of some metric. Uh, you're wondering what the outliers are. You can click on that in the dashboards, or you can uh, issue a query related to the, the query you're asking for those aggregate results. And we, could, we will return the individual results, the individual raw events that contributed to that, that, that aggregate. So it's a pretty rich set of uh, analytics. It's not as rich as Hadoop, but we're not aiming to allow you necessarily to do uh, deep, complex, long-running um, analytics. What we've observed is that many users of Hadoop are actually trying to do relatively simple analysis. And what we're here for is to make straightforward SQL-like analysis, the sort of things you could do in a relational database, um, 
uh, as instant as possible on high velocity streams of events. So just going to talk quickly about uh, a few use cases that we're working with with a number of different customers. Um, we are analyzing uh, telemetry data for telcos. One of our biggest customers is the UK's largest mobile operator, Telefonica. Uh, we're collecting, uh, uh, I can't provide the precise number, but it's many millions of call detail records a day into an Akunu system there. Uh, that's for a range of purposes, including network monitoring and providing real-time insight into uh, for for customer service agents. Uh, we working with several organisations who are monitoring both infrastructure and application level metrics for large compute and cloud uh, in, in infrastructures. So. Uh, that includes a number of animation studios who are running very large render farms and who need to be able to provide, who need real time insight into uh, what's happening on the render farm and where the problems there are due to infrastructure or due to misconfiguration by artists of jobs running. Um, so we're working with high tech manufacturers to provide real time analytics on uh, production lines replacing overnight processes where you know the database would tell you in the morning you've got a bunch of duff devices or your test stations are all miscalibrated and actually providing that insight in real time so that you um, can imp increase yield and increase uh, throughput on, on the production line. We have investment banking customers who are uh, using analytics for financial uh, tick, financial tick data analytics. Um, we power social, uh, several social media services, um, and we have uh, web properties as well, using us to measure advertising, engage, user engagement in the site, and uh, advertising statistics as well. We work with social gaming companies to do funnel analysis, uh, unoptimized journeys, uh, you know, the user's journey as they're purchasing in-game virtual goods, and so on. Um, just one final example is that, you know, Quite often with this, because we have uh, very low latency queries, there's often a feedback loop here. And those results that have been generated by the analytics can be pushed back around into the application that uh, was generating them. And so there are a number of examples here. So for example, with uh, render farm analytics, you can use the fact that you're providing real-time analytics to the organization monitoring the render farm uh, in terms of what's going on on each individual host, you can use that information to make better scheduling decisions of new jobs to the render farm itself. Um, and another example, we have a customer called Halo. They're an Axel-backed startup who are um, basically, I, mean, I like to think of them as a taxi user and taxi dating service, geo-based dating service. They help you hail cabs and um, they run a, you know, they're, they're, they're launched in Chicago, and I believe they're launching in New York soon. Uh, and what we're helping them with is providing a real-time view of both infrastructure, application, and business-level metrics. So, for example, we uh, track the response time of various API calls, but we also um, provide stats on uh, how, how many customers are asking for taxis? How does that break down by geolocation? Has that changed from what normally happens at this particular time of day? Um, how many taxis are uh, responding to each request by a customer? What's the average wait time? How does that relate to the wait time we advertised? Um, and the whole idea here is that these guys are rapidly gr growing very, very rapidly. They're looking to be able to push new builds of the software out uh, with confidence, they have a, a, an app, an iPhone app for drivers and an iPhone app for customers. And they need to be able to uh, deploy new software and know that that software is working. So for example, being able to track battery life usage from one version of the software to another, broken down by, uh, broken down by, by software type is, is pretty important. So the interesting piece though is that we've started powering in-app features. Um, you know, so the same data that, uh, that, that they're collecting for business metrics, how many people are using the service, uh, can get pushed back around to drivers so that drivers can be told um, the area that's near you that you could drive to where there is greatest disparity between supply and demand, where you're most likely to pick up a fare, is over here, so drive there. And so that value add 
uh, functionality is something that increases stickiness and, uh, and, and is attractive for growing the service even faster. So that's, um, that's all I wanted to talk about to start with. I'm very happy to, to, to answer your questions uh, as, they, uh, as, you, as you have them. Y yes, indeed. All right. So there's a slide about my dear partner, the inimitable Robin Bloor. And with that, I'm going to push his first slide and give you the keys, Robin. And folks, we've got at least a couple good questions already, but don't be shy. Send those questions in any time. We'll get to them in the Q&A. So, Robin, it's all you. Okay. Well, thanks for that introduction, Eric. Um, I'm probably going to dash through this fairly swiftly because I think there's probably going to be a lot of value in chatting to Tim about various things. It, it's kind of if you kind of appreciate the position of the analyst in any of the briefing rooms, you you get the slide deck that the vendor's created, but you don't get to know what the vendor's going to say. So there's a whole series of issues that are just really interesting for me in terms of what Akuna can do. Um, so I'll dash through this. I don't think, it's, to a certain extent, I'm... I'm repeating messages that Tim's given, but in a slightly different way. Um, operational intelligence is, is a word that, in our view, has started to crop up to the extent that we think that it's, um, it's becoming a trend. And, uh, you know, fundamentally, what, what it kind of embodies as, a, as meaning is that intelligence, business intelligence capability being deployed in a real-time manner <coughs> And if we wanted to kind of go into some depth about or to put some rules around what deserves to be called operational intelligence, first of all, it has to be fed by stream data or current data at very low latency. So we're talking about looking at data that's not like five minutes old. We're talking about looking at data that's coming in right now in one way or another. Obviously, there's going to be some latency to that depending on how it's coming in and where it's coming in from. It involves um, immediate analysis of the event data that's coming in in order to derive usable intelligence um, from it. It might actually be looking at some older data as well, so you, you may be accumulating a pool of data to look at, but it's, um, it involves continual analysis is the point, and of, of course any kind of analysis that provides anything that's useful. Uh, <coughs> It should be actioned immediately. It's not really operational intelligence if, it, if you send somebody an email. If, you, if, if it triggers an alert or if it sends somebody uh, some individual a message or it provokes something to happen in software, then I think it classifies as operational intelligence. And the final point, which I think Tim made anyway, but, um, you know, we had something called the, the set market, and the set market was kind of much more focused than what I think of a, operational intelligence, but also the, the set market or those early products that were actually doing kind of real-time intelligence in a way weren't well integrated with everything else. And I think that the thing that's happened now is that, you know, a lot of what was being done in that early market wasn't really on very large amounts of data. Now we're looking at fairly large amounts of data, almost to very large amounts of data, coming in a, a, a fair clip. And therefore, there's got to be some kind of architecture associated with what you're going to do with that data after you've used it or while you're using it. You know, so that's what I'd say operational intelligence is. Um, and seeing as I don't think anyone's formally defined it, my definition is as good or bad as anybody else's. The, w the way that I kind of see this or the way that I conceive of this is there's a lot of things out there that can be sending you data. There can be live streams of information that are being organized for, uh, for you. There can be data from the cloud of any sort. And of course, a lot of the data from the cloud, for instance, um, you know, Twitter and even Facebook, it is kind of real-time data. And if you're interested in that, <coughs> then those are very genuine events. There can be events coming at you from servers. Could be log files. Could be actually websites running on servers or whatever. <coughs> there can be events coming from desktops, coming from mobile devices, and of course, the, the Internet of Things that's starting to rise up in embedded processes. Um, and you might actually want to combine some or all of that data. So, you know, this is the stuff that is what I would call event data that's being thrown at you in real time, and there may be fairly large volumes of it. So all that I've done underneath here is put some very obvious things. First of all, there's probably going to be event filtering and routing that's going on. Um, there will be OI analysis of some of that data stream or even lots of those data streams. There may even be, you know, several um, instantiations of some kind of um, 
uh, operational intelligence. And that will feed through to various operational applications, and that might just be um, alerts going to individuals. It, it might just actually be keeping dashboards up to date in a real-time manner. But it also might be actually what's been going on Wall Street for a long, long time. It might be automated trades. It might be some program that is just when it gets a particular message or a particular set of information goes off and does something. So you've got something very um, instant happening at this end of the game. And the next slide is particularly is kind of the other end of the game is basically, yes, we have discovery, um, uh, uh, kind of data analytics, and they need to feed off pools of data, which actually may be um, spread across various different things. They will also require speed, but these guys are not working in real time. They're just working as fast as they can in order to get value. But, you know, if data streams are coming in, then they're going to deposit themselves in one way or another across these data flows. And they're also going to, to um, feed other business intelligence capabilities. So fundamentally, that's all that I wanted to say about this. And hopefully I'll be able to get on to some questions once I've just said the bottom line. OI capability is only just emerging. Um, in my opinion, should not be architecturally divorced from other BI. It needs to be integrated. And the business value of OI is usually dramatic. In, in, in a lot of instances, it's solving problems that weren't solved before. And that's because data wasn't being analyzed in real time before. So some of it, it there is very, very high value on. But there again, it doesn't need to be high value. It's all a matter of um, what a business might need. OK, so I shall go on throwing um, uh, some questions at Tim. But um, in actual fact, I'm probably going to um, – well, I'll, I'll first ask the question, Tim, which is the second question. Is okay you've architected yourself for Apache Cassandra. I can see why you've done that, and I'm not at all critical of that. But is your capability something that you could actually put over other um, what we could call big data stores or fast data stores. Is, 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 that, is it a kind of you clip it on top of Apache Cassandra or is it architected primarily for uh, Apache Cassandra so you couldn't really move it? Um, good, good question, Robin. It's actually, um, well, Analytics actually has a pluggable storage interface and you can deploy over any NoSQL store so long as we have a pluggable interface for it and currently the only ones that we do have interfaces for are Apache Cassandra and uh, in fact our own high performance um, in kernel <laughs> key value store called Castle which is, uh, which, which is something that we're, we have in, in the labs right now. Um, but pretty much what analytics needs is a is a key value store that is rich enough to have both rows and columns. So anything which can fit that model um, works. So we take advantage in Cassandra in particular of the fact that rows tend to get distributed between machines and the columns in a particular row are sequential. So those are the sort of two characteristics that we use to optimize performance of the data model. Now HBase shares those characteristics uh, to some extent. And uh, it would be very straightforward for us to build a, uh, a plugin to, to, to HBase. And it's certainly something that we've been discussing with a number of customers. Okay. Well, I was interested in your mention of this, um, uh, uh, your own key value store called Castle, was it? Um, is that mm -hmm. something that at this point in time you can't say anything about but possibly could get productized? Is that, I'm, I mean, I'm only asking because I'm that kind of person. <laughs> so Castle has been uh, actually part of uh, uh, our distribution of Cassandra for, for a while. Um, I think you know the position we're taking really is that we recently um, have been you know, reached a point with Cassandra where we've been able to contribute a lot of the pieces um, that we had in our own distribution back into the open source project, and so we're sort of wholeheartedly recommending that people use open source Cassandra, uh, you know, Apache Cassandra in production and run analytics over that. Um, Castle in its current form, we're working with a number of partners and a number of OEMs on some quite interesting projects around Castle, uh, which I can't really talk too much about. But, you know, the, the, the overall picture is that Cassandra you know, is a, is a well-established platform. It gives you pretty good performance. It gives you nice scale-out properties. 
but we we, we have a number of uh, number of customers telling us that they reach limits uh, in ter financial terms when they get to a point where actually the volume of, the rate at which they're collecting data necessitates a very very large Cassandra cluster. And there, the uh, future purpose of, of Castle, which I hope to be able to talk a lot more about in the future, is to provide the same benefits but with a significantly lower cost of ownership by allowing you to scale up as well as to scale out at the same time. Well, that's a very interesting comment on it. So, well, we could go off in that direction, but it's probably not the right direction to go off in for the audience. Um, <laughs> because it, it, it's, it, it seems to me that, you know, what originally happened, I'll just say this in passing, what originally happened with the um, the onset of big data and the enthusiasm for an awful lot of this open source stuff that suddenly appeared was that um, what was being emphasized was scale out, you know. And uh, in my experience, especially when you're going towards this kind of stuff, you scale up first before you scale out because you really don't want actually to even go across um, the network at all if you can get away with not doing so because of the latencies involved in doing that. So um, I understand why you would, you know, I, I understand why you would think in those terms. The the thing that's not clear to me from the presentation, and, and it it's obviously was not going to be clear from the presentation um, because it, this is a very broad question, but I kind of want you to discuss it. Um, by the way, I've ignored the first question because it's obvious to me that your latencies simply depend upon <laughs> the speed of ingest because you're going straight into a, a kind of real-time store, which I presume you cache as much as you can. So, I mean, that mm -hmm. question, I think, answers itself. But it's the analytics question. It's, there are an awful lot of things that you can do in analytics. And you've talked about your own version of SQL, which sounded to me very much like SQL in the sense that it, it does select, project, and join, which is, you know, the, 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 the fundamental capability of SQL. But you also mentioned that people use it to define cubes. So what I'm kind of trying to get a handle on is how you use this in the sense of, let's say there's something um, that I wish to find out. Maybe I just want to look at some trends and see whether things are going above and below standard deviation or something like that. Let's imagine that I'm going to try and do that. How do I actually do it? Do, is it all in this um, a, AQL that you've got, or is it something where I would write a routine and plug it in and then ask questions in AQL? It's not clear to me is basically what I'm saying. Okay, good, 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 good question. So AQL, um, so AQL, I guess, has two parts. So firstly, it allows you to define things like uh, the ta tables, which are where you collect uh, events and aggregates into, you know, associated with a sort of HTTP endpoint. Um, and it allows you to define cubes on those tables. So a cube looks like uh, basically a, a select statement with an, with an aggregate, uh, and with a WHERE clause and a GROUP BY clause. So what you're really doing there is saying, these are the range of uh, operations on events coming in that I'd like you to perform, and these are the ways that I would like you, uh, these are the ways that I may ask you to filter them, and these are the ways that I may ask you to GROUP BY them. And I want you to be able to answer all, all range of those queries instantly. So essentially, essentially instantly. So uh, the cube is really sort of a cut-down version of the, 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 the scope of which you can, the, the queries you can ask. So, for example, a cube on the clickstream uh, example I gave would be something like select count of users, where, uh, where browser, uh, where time, group by time. And time would be an aggregate, so a time would be a, a dimension. So these dimensions are I guess, just keys in your uh, keys in your incoming JSON objects, and those uh, those dimensions can have a range of different types, which also uh, define how we treat them. So, for example, you can set up a field to be a time type, which means that we'll be aware of time zones. We will break things down into time buckets, say days, weeks, uh, years, hours minutes, seconds, and so on. Uh, it could be a path type so that you could say site slash section slash page, and we would uh, perform an aggregation up a hierarchy. But fundamentally, what that cube is doing is 
writing the results of an aggregate function into a number of different buckets, and perhaps into many buckets. Now, this is one reason why Cassandra is a great fit for us, because it has, it's write optimized and it has very good write performance. Um, and every event that comes in to Acuna Analytics may get um, magnified and written into a, 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 a many different buckets. So some of our customers have schemas where we're writing, say, 30, 30, every event 30 times. So typically that's okay because um, the benefit of writing that 30 times, that event 30 times over, is that when you come back and ask for question, ask for a uh, ask a query where you have a where clause or a group by clause, those uh, you only need to go and visit the uh, the appropriate bucket, and that will have already processed the aggregates that you've asked for. So the range of aggregate operations that we can do are all the sort of standard aggregates that you would expect in, in SQL. So count, count unique, um, averages, standard deviation. Uh, you can express uh, any arithmetic combination of those things as well. Uh, and we also have a range of probabilistic aggregates as well. So in particular, if you're looking to do trending analysis, so or, or say you're looking at top K uh, keywords on Twitter, for example, Keeping a track of every single keyword is quite an expensive thing to do. Perhaps what you'd like to be able to do is just keep track of the ones which are appearing most commonly, uh, and you have a very skewed distribution of those keywords. So you would define a cube, which is select top K of, uh, of, of keywords. Uh, you'd set keywords up to be uh, a, a type that we call a bag, which is uh, where any it's essentially an array, and any item in that array is, is, is counted towards a, a particular set. So, uh, for example, you know, there, there's, you'd use that just like ta for tags. Um, and then we, you'd be able to come back and ask a, ask a question such as, you know, what were the most uh, tweeted, what were the, what were the most popular or least popular as well? <laughs> what were the most popular keywords um, where geography was this between these two particular times sent by this user or by by users that follow these, these those sorts of queries, um, and we also support approximate count distinct as well because it's very difficult to count uh, uniques across a very large population. So if you're doing intruder detection analysis, security analysis, or you're looking at uh, unique visitors to websites, um, what this allows you to do is flexibly choose a trade-off between performance and and accuracy. So for a given sample size, you know, say a million you could say with 95% confidence that I would like this sample, I would like the return value to be within 20 of the real value. Uh, and that allows us to, that allows us to um, really get significantly higher performance than if we were having to count the uniques itself. So Akuna Analytics does support the precise uh, operators there, but it also has these probabilistic variants. Okay, that's interesting. So if, um, let's say that, you know, I look at what you're doing, you, you, it looks like the kind of platform I need to do, but, but I want to write just some of my own things to plug in. You've got an API. If I wanted to say Python might be a useful way to do it, if I wanted to write some routines in Python that you don't actually have, is that something that's easy for me to do? Is that, is that you know, something you accommodate? Um. Well, there, there are several different places where you can um, plug in very easily. So we have a pre-processing framework which allows you to take, do uh, to, to run uh, basically JavaScript, compiled up JavaScript routines on any event that comes in. So you can modify that event, you can um, split events, you can filter events based on any sort of logic. You can also reach out to session stores and enrich events from there. So, for example, if you had a user ID in your event, but you wanted to relate that user ID to the day that that user joined, then you could take that in and then plug that into a table in a cube and do cohort analysis. Um, so there's that sort of ingest part. In terms of actually plugging in uh, an analytics routine, we don't have support for that right now, mainly for the reason that they, these, these routines are quite carefully optimized and they all have to be incremental. So. We, the key thing to observe about Kuno Analytics is for every event that comes in, we do some incremental amount of work. And that means that uh, we keep the overhead quite low, and it means that the queries uh, at query time don't depend 
crucially, don't depend on either the volume of data stored nor the rate at which new data is arriving. Yet, they give you, you know, results which are fresh to within a second and queries tend to take milliseconds. So, um, what often users do is uh, plug in features of oh, plug in uh, queries on the actual the query side. So using Akuno Analytics almost as a buffer. So you perhaps would write some R routine which uses uh, the R JSON library, or you would query the Akuno API, which is after all just a RESTful HTTP API. Um, so you'd issue a query against that, you'd find out what happened in the last second, and then you could do some, some work on that at that start. So we sort of have, to summarize, we have you know, ways of uh, manipulating data on the ingest side, ways of uh, an API which lets you do interesting stuff on the way out, but nothing really in the middle to, uh, to, to sort of help you increase the range of uh, analytic functions right in the middle. Okay, so well, um, I've run out of my time. I'm going to throw you to the audience. Um, no, normally, the audience has really good questions. Um, what is it like today, Eric? Do we have a lot of good questions? Uh, well, we have a lot of very, very good, very detailed questions. So uh, let's see. <laughs> Let me just dive right in, Tim. And okay, so a, a doozy right off the top here. So one of the attendees asks, are multiple cubes populated and maintained simultaneously to reflect different dimensional or partitioning schemes in order to support high performance access, or are the cubes provisioned and filled in on, say, a chronological pipeline basis? Um, no. Uh, so I, I, I think the question's about are the cubes uh, populated simultaneously? Yes, absolutely. So every event that comes in to a table. Uh, that features in any of the cubes associated with that table will get processed by those cubes and will, within a, within fractions of a second, feature in any query results made on, on those cubes. Oh, that's great. I mean, that, that's really the power of some of this NoSQL stuff, right? It's just that speed, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, the, the, I mean, the hardest thing about uh, any of these NoSQL systems is you're working with a really basic API and what we're trying to do is, you know, we, 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 we're trying to remain true to the NoSQL paradigm of denormalize, you know, write multiple times to make reads really fast. But we've taken that and we've mapped it into a, a, a metaphor which looks just like OLAP cubing. But instead of doing it overnight, so you can come back and, you know, your business analyst can look through data in the morning. What we've done is main, allow you to use the power of NoSQL, as you say, to maintain all of that uh, continuously so that you can actually get real-time answers and use the same setup for operational analytics. Okay, good. And another very pointed question, do a do a Kunu cubes support MDX queries? Uh, MDX queries? Um, so MDX um, is uh, commonly multidimensional. Is that what it stands for, I believe? Robin, you know what that stands for, right? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a multidimensional query language which was um, introduced by Microsoft. Oh, okay, right, yeah. So, um, so MDX query. So, so we support. Um, so, I guess what you're looking at there is being able to do. Um, you you're you're looking to do basically pulling data out of multiple different dimensions at once in, in terms of query axes. So, uh, yeah, I mean, just so, you know, only, only coming across the concept of MDX a second ago, uh, it looks like something that we do. We certainly support multiple group buys and multiple uh, cross-product uh, cross uh, operations. So the joins that we do, though, are limited to equi joins at, at the point of query. So you know, some, some, some people fear that uh, joins are inherently going to always be slow. I guess what we do is we allow you to define a, uh, you know, you define a bunch of cubes, and then if you issue a query with a join in, what that join's really doing is doing two very fast uh, queries on cubes and then joining the results. So. The, the actual the query involving the join needn't be needn't be slow at all, um, and I, I think that's uh, I think that's what this, the, the question's getting at here. Yeah, I think what you've done is you've basically circumvented the need for an MDX query, if I understand correctly how you're how you're processing the. I mean, MDX was basically designed to 
allow well, multi-dimensional expressions, right? Um, so yeah, it's an interesting question, but it sounds to me like what you've done is you've architected around the need for doing that, basically. Yeah, I would suggest, Eric, but I mean, obviously I can't know, but I would suggest that the, the, the level of capability in the AQL is equivalent to the MDX capability. But obviously someone would actually have to do a mapping to make sure. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, just just looking at the MDX data types in, in more detail. So those are exactly the sorts of uh, exactly the sorts of things that we can represent. So we have several um, we have several uh, types built in to support sets, to support tuples, to support uh, right. levels in a dimension hierarchy. You know, I mentioned time uh, gets bucketed at a range of different uh, hierarchies and has a specific treatment to support time zones as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are exactly the sorts of uh, the exactly the sorts of data types that we can support. Good, 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 good. Okay, another very pointed question. One of the attendees writes, if I heard you right, your tool creates additional operational optimized data structures in addition to existing Cassandra models. What kind of impact does the reprocessing of granular data like to an analytics optimized structure have on ingest and uh, and otherwise. Okay, interesting. So yeah, what we do is analytics actually builds a new data model inside uh, Cassandra in a set of separate column families. So you can specify obviously the properties of the Cassandra uh, ring and the column family and so on. But what we do then is we take the de definitions of the cube and you know, for just, just looking at the aggregates here, not the original events, take the definitions of the cube and use the where and group by clauses to be able to lay out uh, aggregate data using Cassandra's rows and columns, and in fact, compound columns as well. So, you know, Cassandra, in fact, has a multi-dimensional um, sparse data model, which is what we exploit. We, we map out our uh, the data for these cubes into that. So um, the, the, I guess the point here really is that you, we run on uh, Cassandra clusters that could be also being used by other applications, but users actually tend to not use the Cassandra API once they use analytics. We sort of hide that from people. You know, you have a, a HTTP JSON API where you can use to just fire events at uh, Akunu and to, and to answer queries. And that really sits on top of uh, Akunu itself. Okay, good. Yeah, good answers and great questions, folks. So here's sort of a standard question. How sophisticated does the user need to be to play around with this stuff? It doesn't sound like it's a, a tool for just your average everyday business user. You need someone who has a, a fairly sophisticated understanding, right? Well, one thing we haven't, yeah, I think you need to, uh, yeah, I think the barrier to entry is certainly not as low as for a user wanting to analyze Excel sheets using Tableau, for example. Um, you, you know, we're, we're, we're not quite there yet. But Akunu Analytics is absolutely intended to lower the barrier of entry for people uh, and help them, enable them to use NoSQL technology. So in particular, it was all built on the premise that uh, users, you know, based on the observation that users are finding data modeling a tricky, challenging process to get their heads around, you know, regardless of whether they had a PhD in distributed systems or not. So um, you know, one thing, thing I haven't mentioned too much about is that we actually built a bunch of live, uh, you know, configurable widgetized dashboards where you can show pie charts, two-dimensional pie charts, geo hash maps in the upcoming release, um, you know, ge sorry, geo heat maps. Uh, you can have line graphs and, and dials and uh, you can drill down into histograms and so on, all the sorts of things that you would expect in a BI tool. And we actually built a browser-based set of BI tools because we looked around at the existing BI tools and basically felt that they weren't appropriate for the operational monitoring use cases that uh, that we uh, th that our customers wanted to put Akunu Analytics to. So in terms of setting up those sorts of things and visualizing your data and dealing with uh, the actual query language, the dashboard makes that much much easier. You know, you don't need to worry about AQL. You can just you know graphically put together your queries and define your table schemas through that browser-based API. Gotcha. Okay, and what about, um, it, how does a user, I know you kind of touched on this, but how does the user, one of the attendees asks, interact to the processing done on the actual data stream? 
uh, it goes on, how do you configure the pre-processing operations on a live stream? Like what kind of leverage or what kind of processing capability does a, a user have manually? Okay, so um, the actual pre-processing on the actual event stream. So I guess there's two parts. One is to actually get your events in. So you know that can either be push or pull. You can write an application which just does HTTP posts to the endpoint for a table, uh, or you can configure Flume to collect data that's coming in via a uh, via you know from log files or from infrastructure data. There, um, in terms of the actual pre-processing of that data, once data is in analytics, you can set up a series of pre-processors which have their own endpoint. So you'd fire events at the endpoint for a preprocessor, so HTTP address for an, uh, a preprocessor. And that is basically just a JavaScript function. So it gets compiled down, and you can do whatever you like in that JavaScript function. And then you can emit multiple different events out the other side of it. So okay, you, you, you take an event, you can split it, you can uh, munge it, you can uh, remove members from it, you can, you, you can manipulate it however you like. Okay, good. And uh, here's another, here's a real doozy for you. So <laughs> I just love these questions. One of the attendees writes, if you are recomputing standard deviation on a large cube with every transaction, it seems like your calculation will back up the input hopper as both the size of the cube and the transaction rate grow. Is that, what do you think about that? Um, I would su suggest that we maintain in parallel sum of squares and uh, count and then use that to get a highly accurate version of standard deviation at query time, but, but, but rapidly. So, uh, yeah, you, we, don't, we don't suffer that problem. Okay. And uh, talk about other tools. So one of the attendees is asking, does a, a Kuno feed any other BI tools already deployed, or are you kind of the, the top-line solution as opposed to kind of mixing and mingling with other, you know, whether it's business objects or Cognos or stuff like that? Sure. So we, um, we uh, you know, our initial uh, ambition, and it still remains our ambition, is to uh, integrate well with uh, and allow our users to to, to, to use the their favorite BI tool to see all this data. Well, when we looked around the market, though, as we started building analytics, we found that many of those tools have very poor support for um, both data that is real time and data that is larger than the memory of a single machine. So, you know, they typically take data into memory, dice and slice it, and then present that to you um, and allow you to, to, to manipulate that. And then typically don't refresh that very, very often, if at all. So that's obviously not great when you really care about live results and the data set that you're trying to deal with is very large um, and uh, ar arriving very quickly. Yeah, and you kind of touched on this. This is another question from an attendee. I think you kind of answered this already in your presentation, but the, the specific question is, does it work mainly for semantically simple data or events? And I think you were kind of talking about that, that you're really focused not on the really deep, really um, complex queries, but more on relatively simple queries. I think that's what he's asking. That's right. So, I mean, if you're looking to do, you know, natural language processing, you know, batch natural language processing, or um, you're looking to do multivariate analysis or um, neural net processing or any of the sorts of uh, deep computational things that you can do in Hadoop because it is a general purpose computing framework, then, you know, Kunu isn't a fit for those sorts of problems. Very often there aren't actually incremental algorithms, you know, for, for, for many uh, classes of clustering, for example, there aren't good incremental algorithms to help you, um, to, to help you answer those, those questions. So, um, for that, what I, you know, what we see our customers do is we often either feed a data warehouse downstream you know, we, we, because we act as a buffer again, you can feed a, a data warehouse at a much lower rate with summarized values out of Akunu, or we sit in parallel to Hadoop. So data comes in through a single Flume architecture, uh, we act as a, sync, a Flume sync, um, and we tackle operational analytical uh, use cases, and data in parallel goes into a Hadoop cluster for complex offline analysis. Yeah, that, this is very interesting stuff. And Robin, maybe I'd like to bring you in just for a, a couple of minutes of wrap-up here. This strikes me, I've seen a couple um, solutions just in the last few months as a very compelling way 
of using these new technologies to create the kinds of analytics that the old-fashioned you know, data warehouse, OLAP cube scenario was designed for, but obviously what you can do because of, you know, partially because of these NoSQL technologies is that you can do much more real-time type solutions as opposed to, as you mentioned before, the sort of overnight processing, but it feels like a very creative way to circumvent the pain and the drudgery of the old world way of ETLing in all this data to a data warehouse and sending it out to all these different OLAP cubes overnight. I mean, goodness, I know that 15 years ago, just maintaining all the OLAP cubes that decision makers wanted, especially in large banks, was a brutal, brutal thing to do. And so I guess, Robin, I'd be curious to hear your perspective on that. It sounds to me like what Akunu is doing is they've found a way to essentially expedite that otherwise very painful and arduous process to make it darn near in real time. Is that a fair assessment? Well, yes. I mean, you know, there, I mean, there's a lot of aspects to this. I mean, you know, the the one that you've got to latched onto, I think, it's kind of important that you take a long time to do this. There are there are ways where it could take less time, but when you actually architect for real time, a whole se uh, a whole series of different architectural um, considerations, uh, considerations come into play. You're never staging data at any point in this. The data is just the, you're processing a data flow, you know, and the data is flowing into the cube, and therefore the cube is as fresh as the, you know, as fresh as the machine can make it, you know. So that's one aspect. But the other aspect that's not clear is that, you know, in the old days you couldn't mix a lot of the analytical stuff together and now it's becoming possible simply because they're functions that go onto data and some of these functions can be knit with things that weren't traditionally knit with. So you also get different capabilities than you had before and then you get the dual benefit of course that they're, that they're available in real time. Tim, have you got any comments on what I just said? Um, no, I, I, I think I think that's a, a really good characterization. I mean, one of the things that I get asked quite often is, you know, how are you different from event processing systems as well, which sort of relates to this uh, real-time maintenance of cubes. I guess the answer is we we store every aggregate and every uh, event that comes in, and we, we we're almost like a backstop for that data. So we're not just a streaming system. The point is, you can come back at any point later and ask a question and have that answer always be up to date. Uh, and that's, you know, it is an interesting distinction um, there, which puts it more in the space of, uh, of, of a, uh, a, a sort of faster, you know, a real-time notion of a data warehouse, if you, if you want to abuse those terms, um, than it does uh, as a sort of streaming system where all you do is pass on an event. Yeah, and I'll throw just uh, one more question at you. There was a question earlier, I guess I'll make it a two-part, about um, validating the answers that you get from here, and I was kind of thinking to myself, it's a very interesting tool for being able to test your traditional system, see what answer you get out of Akunu, see what answer you get out of your traditional OLAP environment, for example. And there's a related question here that I'll throw out to you, one of the attendees writes, uh, does Akunu capture and expose data lineage information to external metadata stores? What kind of operational, technical, and business metadata is supported? So we capture all of the raw events that are coming in, and we maintain a mapping between the aggregates that, um, that, that, that are produced Optionally, we, we, we don't have to, but obviously there is a performance impact. We can maintain uh, a mapping between the aggregates that are produced and almost like a audit log of all of the events that produce that aggregate. And that is what's used for drill down. So um, it's quite an interesting, you know, you see a histogram, you see some outliers, you think, what are they doing there? And you click through and you find out exactly, you know, why there were nine in that particular bucket when you were expecting two. And you can you can you can see where they came from. You have got full details of uh, of those events. So that there is that audit logging type capability in terms of maintaining uh, the other the mapping the other way. So for a given event, where do we uh, where where do we where did that event feature? We don't have that sort of mapping yet. But um, yeah, I mean you know we're we're, we're enriching this uh, as as every week goes by. <laughs> yeah, well that's great stuff. So. Wow, awesome questions from the audience. Excellent presentation by both of our presenters today. 
thank you so much for these great details. It is just such a pleasure to be in this industry because, wow, the amount of innovation is not slowing down, folks, and there are just all kinds of creative ways that you can get the analytics that you want. So big thank you to our friend Tim Morton from Akuno Analytics. Big thank you to our very own Robin Bloor. This does conclude our event. We will archive this webcast. It's usually up right away. Go to InsideAnalysis.com under the webcasts, look under Briefing Room and Recent Episodes. That's where you will find it. And with that, folks, we're going to bid you farewell. Well, thank you so much for your time and attention. And join us next week when we do another real-time operational intelligence briefing with SQL Stream, another very interesting technology. So with that, folks, we'll bid you farewell. But once again, archive should be up shortly. And with that, we will say take care, folks. Bye-bye. <laughs>